If you're up for it, I'll, I'm ready to begin. We could go on chatting. Um, so I should say that this is being recorded, um, and I'm fine with that. And I'm, if you're fine with that, I encourage you to interrupt me at any time uh, and yell out whatever you want. Um, and I'm trying to address it in uh, the best, best way I can. So I'm, I'm all for having an interactive dialogue rather than just. Uh, a talking head, which you could have got off the internet. Um, so I'm actually going to talk, well, I don't know how I got to this title, but uh, I'm actually going to talk a little more broadly than uh, this, but I think the, the nucleus of what I'll say has to do with this idea of a commons, which is something that I'd say is one of my major focus, uh, foci at NIH now. So just by way of introduction, uh, I've been in the rain here now for uh, about eight months. Uh, I moved from uh, being a professor at UC San Diego, where I was a uh, uh, professor of pharmacology, interested in uh, a lot of things around open science, worked a lot, uh, co founded one of the cost journals and things like that. Um, so that's that sort of maintained uh, biological databases. So that was sort of my background in coming into this. And I went to the NIH because there's a realization that the future of biomedical research is going to be significantly different than what it is today. Um, we talk about it, and we'll see this in a minute, as a digital enterprise. Uh, and in fact, so the, the whole enterprise is becoming more analytical. Uh, and that really changes the dynamic quite significantly. And the question is, how can we maximize uh, our rate of discovery in this changing environment? So that's sort of what interests me. Uh, but I want to just give you one slide, and it sort of relates to my background, um, to sort of illustrate how far we've come in all of this. In, what, you know, in terms of what the, not necessarily your objectives, but certainly the objectives that I have uh, as a researcher and now at the NIH. And this is actually uh, taken from a newsletter in 1970, I think it was six, when I was a graduate student in Australia. It is the sum total of a resource called the Protein Data Bank, which is something that I became uh, responsible for uh, later on. And what used to happen is I started researching with this data, and it would arrive on these links uh, by sea mail, and it would take three months for them to get to the lab that I was in in Australia. At which point we would print the data and look at the numbers and go ooh and ah, uh, and actually make, make some interpretation of them. Well, interestingly, and this is relates to my area of research now, this is the complete proteome of Ebola, and I get that in milliseconds, and, and it's a, you know, a whole composite view uh, of a much vaster set of data. And so I just happen to be interested in looking at our targets to uh, using uh, repurposing the drugs to treat, uh, potentially to treat Ebola patients. But uh, the point here is just this absolutely stunning change. And the other thing that's stunning is if I was giving this lecture at the beginning of the century, 1900, I think in the last century, I would have been dead for 15 years because the average life span at that time was about 45. It's now, as you can see, uh, close to 80. And uh, I think some, you know, lots of, uh, that's, that's an incredible success. Obviously, it doesn't do, come just from what the NIH does, but obviously that has a strong influence. And at the same time, we've seen amazing successes in the way we use IT, and I think sort of just sort of into the interface between those two sets of developments are some really uh, thing, things that the NIH have done, which I think we should all we're certainly very proud of, uh, and I think have really uh, impacted. Uh, research uh, in, in the biomedical sciences, namely uh, public access, PubMed, PubMed Central, and, and now a series of other new initiatives, which is what I'm going to sort of tell you a little bit about today. You know, the kinds of things that are coming down the pipe to try and continue this, uh, this sort of uh, trajectory. So, just to, you know, obviously a lot of this has to do with the, the, the data. This is my you know, data fire slide. Everybody has one of these. 
This was the subtotal of the contents of the, of the National Library of Medicine at NCBI in 1993. It was one CD ROM. Uh, it's now 20 petabytes of information, which is of the order of 400 million uh, four door five inhabitants, if you care. But there's much to do, um, but still uh, you know, lots of problems to be dealt with. So we have too few drugs, uh, they're not personalized, and they take too long to get to market. We don't spend enough time on rare diseases. Uh, clinical trials take an enormous amount of time. They're very expensive um, uh, and not retroactive in terms of uh, when you know, problems are discovered, it often takes a great deal of time before that problem is reflected in what happened to that drug uh, in terms of its place in the market. Uh, we don't, we're not doing a great job of education and training for the new workforce. Uh, and I think the, the thing I'll focus on most today is that I think it sort of cross-cuts this audience more than anything else, is that research itself is not cost-effective. In fact, as we move into this digital enterprise, you know, you could argue that 80 or 90% of the time is being spent doing things that are not cost-effective. It's basically wrangling and munging and doing things with data which could definitely be improved. It's a lot easier to improve those things than it is to improve trying to do better experiments or understanding experiments better uh, where they're, they're really physical things, they're analog things. There's not such an excuse in a digital world for not doing better. So how do we do better? Uh, and that's really what I'll focus on. Uh, I won't go into uh, this, but just, this is just another illustration of why we have so much to do, is while in this country, um, and much of the Western world, that life expectancy has gone way up. If you look at places like Nigeria and Angola, uh, it's actually still where we were in 1900. So I think the, the idea uh, that we are having an influence on what's happening in the developing world by what we do, uh, to me, is absolutely critical. But there's a lot of promise out there, and I'm just going to say a little about uh, what those promises are in healthcare, and then I'll get into the sort of uh, what I think is probably of most interest to you if you're not in the healthcare area uh, or, or related to the biomedical sciences. So this is just taken from the, uh, the 100,000 Genomes Project, which is started now uh, in uh, Great Britain, and which will, uh, has a fairly short lifespan. The, the goal is to, in a short time, several years, to sequence fully 100,000 people and use that as a diagnostic tool. And so, uh, you know, I think this is, uh, this is a real step forward and we're going to see uh, a lot more of this kind of endeavor, uh, including in this country where the situation is much more complicated by virtue of uh, economics in particular. Um, another example I'll just show you in passing, which it illustrates where we potentially could go. So this is a graph made from the electronic health records of the complete Danish population, 6.2 million people. And what it shows is comorbidity. The likelihood of if you have one disease, then you will get another disease. And so the thickness of those, so each, each node, each blob on that network is a disease, or a disease state, and each uh, edge, it, the thickness of it reflects how often people pro uh, progress from one state to another. This is an incredibly powerful uh, predictive tool based on a whole population. So we, we don't really have facilities yet, in this country at least, to do anything like this in the sense that we have much larger and more diverse populations but we don't necessarily have the same kind of access or the same level of uh, homogenization of the data uh, within, the, within uh, in the system that they have in Denmark. Interestingly you can then take this kind of thing and you can say because in Denmark from your social security number you can get bank records, your banking details, you can get your health records, you can get social security information. In principle, you can start laying all sorts of other features uh, on top of these kind of graphs. And if you start laying things like socioeconomic 
uh, metrics and parameters on top of it, you start to see other kinds of trends emerging. So, you know, intuitively you can expect that kind of thing. All right? So, but now we're actually measuring it and we're measuring it in some detail. This is the promise of healthcare in the future going forward. We have lots of problems here uh, in, in how we manage the data as well as the economics of it, as I've said, which sort of is slowing us down in many ways. But we, we're clearly gonna, the drivers to get to this kind of thing are, are really mounting because in my view, for the first time in history, uh, the patient is at the centre of the healthcare system. You are the effective, you have control over your own healthcare information to some extent. And as you start to use that, amazing things can happen. So the point is, how do we, how do we, what are we doing at NIH to sort of utilise these, uh, this disruption, these various types of disruption? And I'm going to just tell you about a few of them. Uh, what we're trying to do is to create much more of an ecosystem to support biomedical research and healthcare than we've had before. Uh, it's too much just, just gets lost to the system. So money is spent on a grant, some data is generated, a piece of software is generated. Uh, you know, there's a publication which of course is valuable, but a lot of the enterprise that went into that publication gets lost. And you know, we really need to do a better job. And that, of course, is uh, affecting our productivity big time. So the way we'll be thinking about how we're going to deal with that is uh, by essentially creating a three-legged stool. Because I think there are three aspects of this that have to go in lockstep. There is community, policy, and infrastructure. And within that, of course, is the need to sustain, collaborate, and train, and so on. But well, those are the sort of three legs of the stool. I'm going to say just a little about each one of them. But none of that really makes uh, a lot of sense unless on top of all of that, you have a so-called virtuous research life cycle. So that the, the motivation for researchers to be engaged with community policy and infrastructure is what they're actually achieving in their scientific uh, endeavors. So that's the driver. And so we mustn't lose sight of that. But, but the, at the same time, we want to facilitate through this ecosystem. So let's just look at each of those legs of those, that three-legged stool in uh, what's actually happening and what's coming down the pipe. So increasingly, the notion of data sharing and uh, encouragement of data sharing is something that the, the NIH has taken, uh, taken on and taken seriously as have other agencies. Of course, now we have mandates from the federal government, which we've had to respond to uh, as an agency, to of how we're actually going to move forward with sharing. So that's already manifest in things like the genomic data sharing policy, which provides much more flexibility and more uh, accessibility to genomic information, while of course maintaining uh, the, uh, the required privacy or the desired privacy uh, for an, an individual patient. It also means that we'll have data sharing plans on all awards, which is something we don't have currently, that's sort of detail. Um, but we'll also will enforce data sharing plans. So right now, people with grants have to, uh, and, and if, assuming they were on all grants, have to write a data sharing plan. But no one actually looks at, really looks, seriously looks at that plan. Uh, and sees whether, in fact, uh, the, the, the TIs actually did what they said they were going to do. And uh, it's, it really is not part of the review criteria in the way it should be. But it could be. But first of all, it's quite simple to make the data sharing plan itself machine readable. So if you say you're going to put data in repository X on date Y, we should be able to go to repository X on date Y and see whether, in fact, that has actually happened. If it has happened, then that would release the next amount of funding, if, if you like. So I'm just making a, a sort of simple discussion of this, but you get the idea. Right now, at the moment, the fact that it's, there's a human in the process and uh, it, it, the rules are not very well adhered to, uh, just means that it doesn't work very well. So that's one example uh, of, of how to deal with that, which we're, we're actually in the process of looking at. Another 
piece which is, is critical in all of this is the idea of elevating data citation to be considered by the NIH as a legitimate form of scholarship. So it's the idea that we will actually endorse and encourage people to actually provide citations to data sets. So when you submit a grant application or a, a renewal or some, uh, some other kind of report, we should in fact uh, really embrace and support the idea of data citation as a legitimate form of scholarship. And uh, how that fits into our own workflows is currently being uh, reviewed. But there's a, a small nuance that really makes this pretty straightforward. So that there's, there's an extension that's been worked out by a working group to extend JACS, the, the XML representation that's ingested by PubMed and PubMed Central from the majority of the publishers. That extension covers what data citation should look like in machine readable form. So you know, we're, we will now begin to see and get that kind of information more than we had before. And we should be able to use it effectively. And of course, it's coming from um, uh, other sources as well, because obviously there are now data journals as well that are part of this. So that's that's what an example of what we're doing with policy. A couple of examples. Let me just say a little about what we're doing with infrastructure. So we've just funded. We have an initiative called the Big Data to Knowledge Initiative. We just funded 32 million dollars worth of grants. And this coming fiscal year, it's going to be more like $80 million. Um, and we funded so far 12 centers of data excellence. Um, and each one of those has its own virtuous cycle. So it's, at, you know, it's doing its own research. But they're all associated with different types of data. Everything ranging from uh, genomics data to electronic health records to mobility data uh, and so on. And, and, or data coming from handheld devices and so on. So lots of different data types in this. And then we've also funded uh, a data discovery index consortium, which is going to build, or is building, uh, a means of actually uh, indexing and finding that information. Right now, it's very hard to find data sets that are relevant to what it is that you want to do. So typically, you Google them or you find them through, or try to. That's not very satisfactory. Or of course, you get to them through papers, or ultimately, you actually have to work directly through the investigators, which, or they're just uh, not. There's no idea how to get hold of them, which of course uh, slows the whole process down. The true, the same could be said for software and standards. You know, which standards to comply to, which standards to use, and so on. So these are all initiatives that are underway to, uh, to really sort of create, uh, help facilitate a better ecosystem. And of course, all of them have to be connected. And so what we're starting to see happen in this environment is these, these various groups are now forming working groups to actually do specific work uh, across, across their respective centers. That, to me, is the beginnings of an ecosystem. Whether we can sustain it is an open question, but it's something we're really trying to do. And the way we're trying to do it is through this idea of a commons. And I'm going to say a little about what that means to us. And then, of course, other labs uh, will join the commons, and, uh, and uh, in fact, there's no, there's no restrictions on anyone joining this kind of consortium. Uh, we've been having t talks with actually across a variety of federal agencies. Like, particularly talking to other funding agencies uh, in other parts of the world because I'm very keen to, uh, to try and see if we can do some of these things together. So what is this commons? Well, the commons, essentially, the idea, of course, is all it is really is exactly like a commons in a village. It's a place where you go and you share experiences. So it's really a sharing environment and it's just conceptual. And you'll see how it's substantiated physically in a minute. But within that environment, we're just conforming, the idea is we will just conform to these so-called FAIR principles of finding, accessing, interoperating, and reusing the content. And that content, as I, you should have got already, relates to all different kinds of research objects. So it could be data, software, narrative, and so on. 
Um, and you know, and of course, there's there's uh, provenance and attribution associated with that. But the computing platform itself is agnostic. So uh, these are the folks that are actually sort of driving this forward right now. Uh, Vivian Benazi and George Thomas um, but really what it is, is the idea of a set of digital objects in this space um, and then a, a means of searching through this uh, searching index I described and then an agnostic compute platform and that's really the commons. So let's just look at each of these pieces very quickly. So the commons, there's a uh, conceptual framework, is made up of public clouds, not the usual players. Uh, it could be high performance computing resources, could be institutional repositories, um, so in-house compute solutions and then things from the private sector. So to me, for this to work in this way, the business model by which this operates is actually a critical facet. I'll say something about that in a second. But just to quickly go over uh, the other pieces of it. Uh, so you know, how we identify these research objects, which is critical in this space, this is something that the community, and that's the other part of this that I haven't emphasized yet, is none of this makes any sense unless it's driven by the community. You know, for us, for the NIH to say, we're going to do this, you know, people will sort of say, yeah, okay, if you give them some money. Um, but that doesn't change anything. You know, it, it has to come from what they really see as important. So you know, there's undoubtedly a, a momentum broadly across the research community for this kind of identification. So we're working, there was a meeting in January to, uh, in the UK to sort of discuss what these, what these initial identifiers would look like. Could be DOIs, could be other, some other form of hand. The community will decide that. And then the, these indexes we're building, those, uh, those tools will trigger off those, uh, those identifiers. An example of where this is, brings all this together, just to illustrate, is that there's some pro there's a uh, community that's emerged out of all of this called uh, the Global Alliance for Genomic Health. Just to, out of interest, because people are looking a bit bored, how many people have actually heard of it? The Global Alliance for Genomic Health. Uh, a couple, okay. So this is a, now an organization, and it tells me a lot about who I'm talking to. Maybe I'm too talking the wrong level, but uh, because you're obviously very good at some things, but maybe I'm talking about healthcare. <laughs> How do I get out of this horrible gap? I'm not so <laughs> you can beat me up afterwards, I'm sorry. Um, so, now I forgot where I was going. Okay, so this is a, a group, uh, there's about 100 or so institutions signed on to it. Uh, and they're, you know, they're really active in a variety of ways. They've got a series of working groups. Um, one of those working groups is dealing with, uh, particularly around APIs. So an example of how this would work is a question researchers ask is, I want to know what variation there is in this position, chromosome 7, position X, uh, across the human population. Right? So, you know, how do you answer such a question right now? Right now you would go to some centralized resource, if such a thing exists, but it would only have a small fraction of the data. But in the world of the commons, more of that could actually be available from more sources. If those sources are at least accessible through uh, some mechanism. So that mechanism is really having an application that sits out there, and there's one being prototyped right now called Beacon to do this. And really, it, what it's doing initially is to test people's willingness to share. And the number of resources that are actually coming into this environment to be shared in this way is growing fast. So it's already becoming you know, a powerful tool. And all it does is it essentially goes off. There are APIs into each of these different resources that have been written by communities who are interested in accessing this information. And it returns uh, nothing more than a, a letter that happens to be present at that position on the DNA. Okay? So it's not revealing anything about patient, you know, there's protections to do that. It's just returning a piece of information that collectively, I don't think anyone, however private they wanted their information to be, would complain that if that, that was without de identified, that that was being uh, released. I mean, the, the consent model is another matter for all this, but I won't get into that. That's sort of the basic 
the basic idea. So we're testing the ability of sharing, we're testing the ability of communities to come together to build the tools that's necessary to make this work for the community. So that's the basic idea. Um, and I won't, this is what it looks like, uh, I won't go into the details of this. So I'd much prefer to have uh, a discussion. But what's also important is the idea uh, of uh, a business model. So the business model for this is different. How many of you here are affiliated with academic institutions? Most of you probably. Yeah. Okay, so this, this is where it's important probably to wake up because uh, <laughs> this is where things potentially could be different. I would emphasize that what we're doing right now is a small test to evaluate this process. Okay. And the process, this business model is as follows. What happens right now is that you or folks in your institution, they write a grant to the NIH, they get, uh, in that grant they put a line item in for hardware and software and things like that. Essentially, management of data resources. So, and if they're successful, they get that money. Then what happens? Well, you know, and I know this because I was a PI, uh, maybe I'll siphon off a bit of that money to do something else. Uh, or, so I'm not actually spending it on exactly on what I said I was going to. Or uh, I buy this, this equipment and occasionally it's overutilized, but quite often, a lot of the time it's just ticking there and not actually doing anything. So this is not a supply and demand model, right? So it's not necessarily cost effective. As we move more to an environment where people are using cloud resources more and more, it's easy to then to think about a different kind of business model that's built on credit. Okay, so don't, it's, don't make it sound like a you know, credit card debt. Um, but essentially, what happens is you write the grant. Instead of being given those dollars in hard cash, you're given credit in those uh, to that amount. Then you can spend those dollars in whatever Commons compliant resource you like. Commons compliance means nothing more than that, that environment has agreed to share with appropriate protections. And eventually, maybe it'll start using the same research object identifiers and the other things that I said. Okay? But what you're doing is you're getting that credit. You as the customer are then deciding what to do, where to spend that in a, a Commons compliant environment. So it could be that your institution uh, is part of the commons, in which case you, you would choose to spend it there. Or, uh, you know, it could be a uh, cloud, public cloud, it could be some other kind of resource that's available to you. So, but you choose. So, and you can change at any time. And who you choose is going to be dependent on the pricing model for each of those given resources. So it drives competition into the marketplace. Also, you, you're only, you get assigned a certain number of credits. If you don't actually use those, those credits can be reassigned to someone else. So it gets, you, you've got this supply and demand. Or, of course, you can, if you actually have a demand for more than you originally requested, you can ask for more. So it, it, we believe, uh, and this is just, uh, I should say that the, the model we're using for this also enables, enables a public-private partnership. So it also enables um, the private sector to be part of this enterprise. Um, and so you know, what it enables is what we want to test and evaluate is the, the idea that we can actually do more with our computing dollars than we currently do to support biomedical research. We can do it in a way that is more cost effective. We don't actually know how much we spend at the NIH on uh, com computation and data related activities right now because it's hard to sort of, because we have obviously very computational types of awards that we make, but then there are also things for which computation is just a part of the award. So we don't know, but it's undoubtedly well over a billion dollars a year. The question is, can we do better with that money and can we incite this research to be done in an environment that facilitates sharing and reuse and reduces a lot of this time and energy that's just wasted before we get to the real science. These are all open questions. And this is not a major, you know, big undertaking we're doing here. It's something we're piloting and testing and trying to evaluate whether in fact 
any of the things I just said turn out to be true. So it's just it's an experiment. So that's what I want to say about the commons. And then I'll just say a little about uh, you know, training and what we're doing. We're actually undertaking a, a whole series of training initiatives, um, including particularly with emphasis on minorities and underrepresented communities. We're actually going to be putting out um, a request for a, a, a workforce development centre, which will focus on sort of collating uh, a lot of existing course materials around data science that are relevant to biomedicine. That's a problem right now. There's a lot of stuff out there, but how do you, you know, the idea of course is to develop uh, metadata representations to the, uh, that actually describe virtual and, and physical courses so that they can, um, they can be properly catalogued in, uh, in such an environment. So I, mean, I think that would be uh, a real facilitator. That's just an example. And then there's actual courses and other things we're supporting. We're also trying to support uh, other types of communities. So for example, today, yesterday and today, and I was there yesterday, and I unfortunately couldn't go today, but uh, I'm, we're, we supported a workshop with the gaming community. So some of the famous gamers uh, were willing to come and actually describe the kinds of things they do, the kinds of algorithms they apply, the kinds of tools they apply, with the view that maybe we can do something that's going to benefit biomedical research. So it's reaching out to these communities that uh, we've not you know, traditionally reached to. Uh, it's a very interesting experiment. And I was worried to death when I went up there to see it yesterday that uh, they, would, they would all be sitting around not communicating with each other. It was quite the opposite. They were jumping up and down and running around and white it was, it was, there was, there was a lot of energy in that room. Whether anything meaningful will come out from it, I, who knows, but uh, it's an interesting experiment. So I just use that to illustrate that we're trying to think and do some things that are a little different than usual. Um, you know, and I think what we've also done is I've actually polled uh, across the NIH, there's 27 institutes and centres. And I polled them the kinds of problems that they have and I, uh, that, that's preventing them from fulfilling their individual missions and then try to sort of collate what that means. And these are just some of the sort of, uh, I'd say, broad areas which we feel we need to work uh, to improve situations. So I won't go into a lot of these details. Uh, I'll put these slides online on slide share. But, you know, the idea of homogenization of large disparate uh, structured and unstructured data sets, how you use this, integrate this information and use it together. Obviously huge problems, uh, but huge potential benefits, particularly as we look at from everyone, from someone's genome all the way through to uh, actually their behavioral patterns, let alone their uh, electronic health records. So lots of opportunities. Uh, uh, visualization, modeling, uh, looking at sparsely populated data, all these are kind of problems that exist. And you can apply them in lots of different healthcare situations. Uh, you know, so the idea of one of these projects relating to mobility, which I mentioned before, but it's really to look at the outcome of surgeries in children with cerebral palsy, and, uh, and also and look at their gait physiology and try and understand uh, you know, how uh, mobility can be improved and things like that. And there's lots of other examples like that. These are a whole group of, this is a trans NIH initiative. I report directly to Francis Collins, who's the director of NIH. Um, this covers all of those 27 institutes and centers. There's, uh, you know, well over 100 people involved. Uh, and it just goes to show that, that or what we're trying to say is data is a, a, a how we handle and manage data how we use it effectively uh, is a big part of what we, uh, what we hope to do going forward. So that's really what I wanted to say, and I would hope to get a lot of pushback, uh, a lot of argument, a lot of questions. Thank you.